Well, good morning, church. It is uh, great to be with you this morning. We want to welcome our members and our visitors and those who are uh, watching online. Uh, For those who are visiting with us, I'm not the regular preacher. He is actually leaving the building right now. Uh, That's that's our brother Wayne, and uh, he and Cindy went on a Wild West vacation. And he contacted me and he told me, this is a few days ago, he said, we are stuck in Moab, Arizona, having car problems. And I warned him against dwelling amongst the pagan Moabites. Uh, But they didn't listen and they were there for a couple of days. And anyway, they got in um, late last night, early this morning, and he'll be back uh, in the pulpit uh, this evening. Before I get to the lesson this morning... I want to just say a a couple of words about the situation that's going on in uh, the Hazard, Kentucky area. You guys have probably heard the news reports. Um, The latest uh, death toll I heard from the flooding was 25 and counting, including three children. Uh, There have been hundreds of homes destroyed. Uh, 10,000 homes and businesses are still without power. And there have been about 1,200 either air or land or water rescues. Um, More than 330 people in shelters right now. And I want to let you know, once the the Churches of Christ disaster response team is set up, they're in the process of setting up um, the basis of operation around that area for volunteers. Uh, But Miss Donna and I plan to go there. Um, We were in western Kentucky, I guess, earlier this year or last year, whenever it was, and now we're going to be going to eastern Kentucky. Uh, But we certainly need to be praying for these people. Uh, This is an opportunity to help people, to encourage people, to share our faith with people, um, to be uh, doers of the word and not not merely readers of it or hearers of it. And so we're going to try to help them and encourage them, and um, we'll we'll have more details. Right now there's active... um, recovery operations going on. They're still finding bodies and that kind of a thing. So we have to let that, the first responders do their job. And then we have to let the water come down a bit. Uh, But then we're going to get in there and try to help them and uh, muck some houses and pass out some gift cards and and try to encourage them. So please, uh, please keep us in your prayers and we'll have more, more details about that um, as they become available. So when I was a little kid going to Bible class, I always enjoyed uh, what seemed like the annual lesson that we had on David and Goliath. And one of the things I appreciated about the the David and Goliath lessons was that our little teacher that I had, she always used a flannel graph, and I was always impressed as a child with the size of Goliath. So we're going to talk about this story this morning, and you can be turning to 1 Samuel 17 if you'd like to. But I don't have um, any flannel graphs up here to show you, but I wanted to um, impress upon you with some sort of visual aid uh, just the size of Goliath. And so anytime you're going to compare sizes of anything, you want to start with Greg Husband. Uh, Greg comes in at about 6 foot 10, and um, I understand this is a photo that was taken from one of his dreams. Uh, He was actually in, in some distress, and a hungry hippo came and comforted him. Um, but Greg's not as big as God made them. Uh, here we have Shaq. He comes in even taller than Greg. He's seven foot one. I understand Shaq wears a 21 triple E shoe, so he's a big fellow. But that's still not as big as Goliath. We have here now Goliath. Uh, the Bible says he was six cubits in a span. And depending on which scholar you, you read about or you read from, which commentary you're reading, that can be anywhere from 8 foot 5 to 10 foot 6, and it comes down to how, how you measure a cubit, how you measure a span. So there's some debate on that, some range. I'm going to put them at about uh, 9 feet 9 inches, as you see there. And to put those three guys in perspective, I thought I would show you a picture of Janet. Uh, <laughs> she comes in at around 5 feet, um, and as high as 5 foot 2 if she's just had, just had her hair done. But... Uh, she stopped growing around middle school, and you can just see how big those, those men are in comparison to her. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the story. We're going to kind of tell the story again, and then we're going to look at six uh, key principles that I think we can learn from it. So again, if you want to be uh, turning to 1 Samuel 17, that'll be our text for this morning. 
So what do we know about young David? Well, we know he was a handsome shepherd boy. We know he loved music and poetry. Uh, in the previous chapter, uh, perhaps when he was around age 12 to 14, he was appointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king replacing Saul. Uh, God had rejected Saul as king because of his pride and his disobedience, and God's spirit had departed him. Conversely, God's spirit came upon David in power. We know that from uh, chapter 16, verse 13. But for now, his appointment as king remained a secret. So David, the young shepherd, was recruited for his ability to play the harp. Uh, he was put to work in the king's court to comfort the king whenever he was afflicted with an evil spirit, the Bible says. What's interesting about that is David's time on the king's court and playing for the king would have given him opportunities to kind of learn the environment and learn their system a little bit and be around the government um, that he would one day lead as king. So young David goes back and forth uh, from tending sheep, as you see there on the left in Bethlehem, to playing the harp for Saul in the king's court. Well, time passes, perhaps a few years, and David's father, Jesse, asks him to go to the battlefield to check on his three oldest brothers and to take food to them. So he arrives on the battlefield, and he sees that Saul and the Israelites are camped in the valley of Elah, and the Israelites uh, were up on one hill, and the Philistines were on the other with a valley in between. So to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about here, uh, this is a map of the area. That little red dot there is where the Valley of Elah was. About 15 miles west of Bethlehem, about 20 miles east of the Mediterranean, on a, uh, a pretty well-traveled um, travel route. This is the way that the Valley of Elah looks today. And this kind of gives you a lay of the land. Saul's camp is there to the left, uh, the Philistine camp to the right and the valley in between with the creek that, that cuts through it. And this is a close-up of that creek. So this battle that we're going to talk about this morning took place in this area. Uh, my son was here, my oldest son Jason, on a mission trip uh, several years ago on a Holy Lands trip. And he actually picked up five uh, small stones for me from this creek bed. And I have those at home. And I went into a, a flea market and got me a slingshot. And so I have those as kind of a... a a visual reminder for me of what took place in this valley, but it, it is an interesting story. So we talked about David. Let's talk about his opponent, uh, Goliath. We know he was from Gath. We know he was a champion, no ordinary fellow. Uh, the Bible says, again, he was six cubits in a span, so over nine feet tall, maybe as much as ten feet tall. Uh, he was heavily armored. He had a coat of bronze that went shoulder to knee, uh, 175 to 200 pounds just for that. Uh, he wore a bronze helmet and leggings, a bronze spear, and the head of the spear, the Bible says, weighed about 20 to 25 pounds. And then he had a shield carrier um, who was a man, a, a very unfortunate man, who had the job of standing in front of him. Uh, and that man carried a full-sized shield to protect him from arrows. So every day for 40 days, Goliath challenged and taunted the Israelites. You, you might say in today's uh, vernacular that he talked trash to them. So we're going to uh, read about that now in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17. We're going to pick up the story in verse 8. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. <clears throat> but if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Well, this was a common tactic <clears throat> amongst the Eastern people. A lot of times when you had two battles that were going to fight, uh, rather than just go battle, you know, the entire army against another army, and decimate each other and end up with both sides suffering heavy casualties, sometimes they would do this. They would say, you give us your best man, we'll give you our best man, we'll let the two of them fight one-on-one, -on -one, and then whoever wins will get all the spoils. So it was kind of an efficient way to, <clears throat> to resolve a conflict. Well, Saul and the Israelites <clears throat> excuse me, were scared to death. 
they were paralyzed from fear. Verse 11 says they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Uh, King Saul, interestingly enough, wasn't willing to take on Goliath, even though we know that Saul had his own considerable size and he had had some past successes against the Philistines. So he was kind of a coward during the whole thing. But he did offer up wealth and his daughter and an exemption from taxes to anyone who would kill Goliath. Well, so David is there, young David. He hears Goliath and he's just beside himself. In verse 26, he says, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So we're going to pick up the story now in verse 28, and then after that we're going to um, offer some application. This is um, a bit of a long reading, so bear with me. You may want to follow along in the text. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done? Was it not but a word? And he, tur- and he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached as he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword and with the spear and with the javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand." When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out his stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank in his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. 
so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shariam as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. So David ends up bringing Goliath's head to Saul. He gets a high rank in the army and is very successful, causing, of course, Saul to become very jealous of him, and that's going to play out in later chapters. So this morning, what I want to do is have us look at uh, six principles that I think that we can take from this story. I think this is far more than just a cute story that we share with our our children in a child's Bible class. I think this is uh, there are principles here that we as adults can learn from. So principle number one is <clears throat> giants do not make or break us. They simply show us who we already are. There's many stories, many heroic stories that come out of battle, that come out of war. And this morning I want to share with you briefly the story of Marine Corporal Jason Dunham. On April 14th, 2004, while he was on a patrol near the city of Karbala, Iraq, uh, his unit came under attack and a, a, an enemy grenade was thrown and he deliberately jumped on the enemy grenade uh, and saved the lives of the nearby Marines. Uh, Dunham was gravely injured from that uh, grenade blast and he died eight days later and then he was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. <clears throat> And if you think about uh, Corporal Dunham and what he did, he, he did not become a hero that day. He was already a hero. The events of April 14th simply showed the world who he already was. And I think when we look at the story of David and Goliath, David did not become a hero the day that he killed Goliath. That hero was already in him. He already had the makings of a hero, the character, the integrity of a hero, And what happened on the battlefield that day with Goliath simply exposed who he was. It showed who he truly was. So again, giants do not make or break us. They simply show us who we already are. Second principle is victories are first won in the training room, not on the field. It's foolish for us to believe that that we can prepare for a fight at the last moment without having Uh, prepared for that battle ahead of time. Uh, Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 25. He says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So Paul here is talking um, about spiritual discipline. He's talking about spiritual training. And he, he's going to go through these, this spiritual training, this spiritual uh, discipline to prepare for the battles that he's going to face in life. And he wants to win those battles so that he ultimately can win the crown. And as I was thinking about this principle, I thought of a story I had heard some time ago um, This happened in the 1956 Rose Bowl, and the Michigan State kicker, David Kaiser, who is pictured there, uh, he kicked a 41-yard field goal. It was his first career attempt, and he made it, and it gave uh, Michigan State the win in the Rose Bowl. Well, what's interesting is what happened after that kick. He returned to the bench, and, of course, his... The crowd was going crazy. His, uh, His teammates were applauding him and patting him on the back. And his coach, Duffy Daugherty, said to, said to Kaiser, he said, nice going, Dave, but I noticed you didn't watch the ball after you kicked it. How come? Why weren't you looking at the ball? And Kaiser replied, you're right, coach. I didn't watch the ball. I was watching the referee to see how he would call it. You see, I forgot my contact lenses. They are back at the hotel. I couldn't even see the goal posts. Well, the coach was initially uh, shocked and maybe a little bit angry about that. He was upset that his kicker hadn't told him about the missing contact lenses before the game. But then he thought about it for a minute, and he changed his mind. And he thought, you know, why shouldn't this kicker, my kicker, kick without his contact lenses? He was a disciplined kicker. He had trained a long time. He had practiced for many long hours. He knew that right angle. He knew the distance to the goal, even though he couldn't see the goal. 
you could say that the whole process of kicking a field goal was programmed into his body and into his mind due to the ongoing discipline of daily practice. And so in that moment when the, he kicked the ball without being able to see the post and it sailed and went through the goal post, all of that discipline and training had paid off. Well, folks, we need, to, we need to go into some spiritual training. We need to go through some spiritual discipline. We need to be studying our Bibles. We need to be praying for strength. We need to do these, this spiritual training, this spiritual discipline in advance of the spiritual giants that we're going to face farther down the road. So the question I would ask you on this point this morning is, are you spending time every day in spiritual training, in the, in the spiritual weight room? Number three, practice faith in the lesser battles of life. So when I read this story about young David and the confidence that he showed uh, before Goliath, I have to ask, where did that unwavering confidence come from? How can a a young shepherd boy um, stand up to a giant like that? I mean, this is a a shepherd boy who plays the harp. How did he have that confidence uh, when faced with Goliath? Well, I think the answer is he had seen God work to vanquish lesser adversaries in his life. In fact, if you go back to verse 37, uh, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So the faith that had sustained David and strengthened him in the lesser battles of life were preparing him for the day that he would one day face Goliath. Nobody just goes out with any experience Um, without any training to face a giant. Faith doesn't work that way. But as challenges come up in our everyday lives and we see God help us to overcome them and we see that God carries us through those smaller challenges, our faith grows. Uh, Jeremiah spoke to the people of his day who were failing for this same reason. And I I love this passage here uh, from Jeremiah 12.5. It says, he told them, if you have raced with men on foot, and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you are so trusting, what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? And so I think what Jeremiah is telling the people and what he's really telling us is, if, if you're going to race with horses, you've got to start out by racing with men. You've got to start out in the small battles of your life, and you've got to overcome them and develop that training and develop that discipline before you're going to be in position to race horses or to face giants. And so until we become faithful in the little things in life, um, we'll never be ready for the big issues when they come. And that brings us to the fourth principle. Everyone who's never killed a giant will say it can't be done. Everyone who's never killed a giant will say it can't be done. I think that's so true. In fact, you go back to the story, when David began um, asking uh, about this giant, the first opposition he met wasn't from uh, the enemy, but it was from his own brother, uh, Eliab. Uh, remember, he was, Eliab was the first one to walk before Samuel as a potential successor to Saul, uh, but he was rejected um, as a potential king, and I think we see here why. So Eliab turns to his brother and says, uh, and you can just see this animosity. He says, why did you really come? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. So his his brother is kind of chastising me here, trying to pick a fight. And David, to his credit, he just keeps calm. Uh, He keeps his attention on what is really important here, which is the giant. He chooses his battles wisely. Uh, There was something more important to deal with than a jealous brother who, by the way, as far as we know, had never killed a giant. And I think this is so true. It never fails. If you have a dream or a vision or something that you believe God is calling you to do, something that God has put on your heart, there will be somebody who's never done it telling you it can't be done, and they will doubt you. And again, I say everyone who's never killed a giant will say it can't be done. Number five, never adopt the enemy's methods. 
When David approached King Saul, the king tried to prepare him for battle by dressing him in his own armor. And on the, surface, that, on the surface, that would seem to make sense. Given the size of Goliath and the size of his army, you would think you would want to armor up and put on as much armor as you, as you could. Instead, what David wants to do is fight this battle with what we call in the military asymmetric warfare. And the idea of asymmetric warfare is you get an advantage on your enemy, not by copying your enemy's tactics, but on, but on doing something different, something that they wouldn't expect, something that is asymmetric. So what David's going to do is he's going to win this battle not by copying his enemy's methods, not by armoring up, but by leveraging God's amazing power. And we must do the same in our own battles in life. In Ephesians 6.12, Paul writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Later, Paul tells us that the only way we're going to win these battles is to put on the full armor of God, which includes righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the very word of God. When you put on God's armor that we just described there and you use it the same way that David used that sling, you're going, to be, you're going to begin to see the giants fall in your life. And then the sixth principle, finally, we need to remember the size of our God. This is, this is perhaps the most important principle. The Israelites were afraid because they were comparing Goliath's size to their own size. From that perspective, they were outclassed. They were outnumbered. They were outarmored. David, on the other hand, doesn't buy that construct at all. What he does is he compares Goliath's size with God's size. What a different perspective. In fact, I thought about going back to that first chart of, of height set that I used, and I thought about trying uh, to, to visually represent God on there, and you can't because God is too big to fit on a chart. Um, but that's the way that David was looking at the battle. He was comparing uh, Goliath not to himself, but he was comparing Goliath to his God. And so in order to defeat the giants in our lives, we have to focus on the size and the power of God. And among many passages that, that we could look at to kind of emphasize this point, I came across three that I thought were just really powerful uh, the first one, uh, from 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And so a question that I would ask you guys this morning is, are there some strongholds in your life? Are there some mountains in your life? Are there some Goliaths in your life that need destroying? And then we read in 1 John 4, 4, the passage that Gary uh, read, little children, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Think about that for a minute. He who is in you, Christ in you, is greater than he who is in the world. What he's telling us there is God is bigger and greater and more powerful than any giant you might face, any obstacle that might be in your path. And then, of course, a very uh, popular passage from Philippians 4.13, Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He doesn't say some things. He doesn't say most things. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And, you know, it's easy to say those passages. It, it was easy to type them. It's easy to read them up there on the slide. Um, the hard part is believing them. The hard part is owning them and internalizing them and really believing what they say. And I think it's that lack of belief, it's that lack of faith in these passages that will defeat us if we're going to be defeated. A giant killer has got to be a man or woman of giant faith. Uh, and I think the truth is that we have a choice to make and we are faced with a question who are we going to rely on to defeat our giants? And who are we going to count on to carry our burdens? Because the secret to overcoming giants is understanding what David understood, and that is the battle belongs to the Lord. It's his battle. It's his fight. So in conclusion, I want you to think just for a moment this morning, uh, what are the giants in your life? 
uh, just take a moment to kind of reflect on that. What is the big giant that you're facing in your life? Because I'll tell you, we all have giants. We are all facing something. Uh, there's a quote I like that says, everyone you know, be kind because everyone you know is facing a battle. Uh, these giants come in different shapes and sizes. I, I have a sampling of them up there that you can look over. But see if you can find your giant on this chart. It could be for you younger people, it could be a bully at school, or maybe you're having uh, academic struggles at school. Some of you are dealing with uh, physical ailments. We read about some of them in the bulletin, but there's a lot more that are out there that we don't read about. Uh, some in this room are dealing with addictions, or we're trying to overcome an addiction. Uh, some are dealing with habits that, are, that have got a hold of them and that they're trying to, to fight. It may be a particular sin that you are up against, that is your giant. It may be financial pressures. It may be pressure to pay off uh, child support, let's say. It may be a job layoff or, or a frustration you have with your job. It could be a parenting problem. Uh, maybe you have a young person that you can't quite figure out or a teenager that's giving you problems. Maybe that's your giant. Uh, maybe it's loneliness. Maybe you're a, a widow or a widower who is grieving the loss of your spouse even many months after they have passed away. It still hurts uh, as much as it hurt uh, that very first time. Maybe you're dealing with heartbreak. Maybe you're doubting God's promises. Maybe you have a dream that, that people in your family, people in your circle are doubting of you, and that's the biggest obstacle. That's the biggest giant. Um, and, and maybe it's something else. Uh, you know, we're not going to do this this morning, but I thought it would be interesting, and, and I have seen a, a congregation do this one time, but I thought it would be interesting this morning if we all lined up, don't get up, but if we all lined up here and we each one by one came up here and held up a sign with our giant, you know, what is the giant that you're facing? Um, I think it would be pretty illuminating. It would be pretty telling, and I think it would help us to see... Um, it would help us to be vulnerable in sharing that, but it would help us to see the, the numbers of, of burdens that are out there, the number of giants um, that people are facing. And so we're not going to do that this morning, but I want you to think about what that giant is um, that you're facing, and I want you to think about the fact that everybody in here is facing some sort of, of giant like that. Uh, each of us at some point will face a person or a situation that will look like a mountain, that will look like a giant, and when we face that, it's going to cause us to naturally feel very small in the face of it, very incapable. Um, it's going to be something that may stand in the way of us, of, of God fulfilling his purpose in our life. And whatever that obstacle is may seem like it's larger than even Goliath. Well, we don't all share the same giants, but hopefully these principles that David used in fighting his Goliath are things that we can use uh, to fight the own battles in our lives. And I want to close with uh, Psalm 55, 22. David says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. So think about that obstacle you're facing. Think about that giant. Think about that mountain that, that stands before you. And he says, cast your burden on the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's put those fights in his hands. Uh, this morning, if there's anyone here in the audience that has a giant like that that you're facing and you want to cast your burden on the Lord and have us as a congregation uh, pray for you, we're willing to do that. Or perhaps if there's someone here who would like to put on Christ in baptism, uh, whatever your need, we invite you to come forward as together we stand and sing.